was that the bound that you attributed to Weinberg for the upper bound on Lander was actually worked out by Tipler and myself in our Anthropic Principle book a couple of years before oh, his paper. I don't remember it there. I see. Um, but my question is, the eternal inflation scheme that you know you you stressed, you keep getting this paradox of infinity over infinity, and the answer you get depends on how you do the counting. It, is there a way to force this into a finite problem? No. You know, either by choosing the topology to be globally compact. Unfortunately, so not. No. Uh, be, uh, well, I mean, yes, but yes, you can, in, in uh, but yes, you can in, in completely, in totally arbitrary ways that give you worse problems. So, in other words, the the problem is no matter how things start, whether you make the topology, whether it's, uh, you know, whether you say, no matter what, no matter how you start. Uh, as you keep going, the universe gets infinitely big. And any way of weighting things will have just more and more and more stuff later and later and later uh, in time. There's infinite space-time volumes. Okay? There's infinite space-time volumes, and it's a literal infinity. So it's true. It's a consequence just of following, just consequence of just following your nose, solving the equations. Again, there's no indication. It's not like trying to extrapolate as we get to the Planck scale of collisions of particles where we know something is breaking down. It's not like that, but there is something, uh, there is something, uh, there is something paradoxical about it. I should say that, that, uh, that this, 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 this question of what, uh, what this, the sitter entropy means is a very interesting one, right? Because there's all these analogies between, uh, I mean, many people have thought about this a lot. I'll just say one small thing about it. Um, there's all these analogies between being inside an accelerating universe and being in a black hole. And in both cases, there is some, uh, in, both, in both cases, there is an entropy, but the entropy of a black hole might make sense. There it is. There's something sitting there. It has some number of degrees of freedom. But what could the entropy of the accelerating universe be? Because it naively seems infinitely big. Okay? But it's very interesting that if you try to embed that question in, in, if you try to regulate it somehow to be continuously connected to something we think we understand, uh, then, then something interesting happens. For example, you might, you, you might look at a universe that's not uh, eternally accelerating, but just is inflating, like we thought maybe the early universe was. If you have just ordinary inflation, ordinary slow roll inflation, then inflation eventually ends, and you can wait, and you can see all these modes come back into your horizon. You can see how many of them came back into your horizon. And just by counting them, that's a good measure for the, for, for the sort of size of the underlying in, inflating space time. Now, it's a very interesting fact that if you have an ordinary inflating universe and, it, uh, and, and inflation ends, you never get to see more than e to the s the sitter of those quanta come back into your horizon blade. And as, as actually, as you start approaching the place where that would happen, it's precisely when you get into the eternally inflating regime of the underlying space time, and you actually get swallowed up inside a large uh, fluctuation in a big black hole, and you don't get to see anything again. So, so if you try, if you try to continuously connect this eternal inflating space time to ordinary inflation that we understand, you can't do it. That <laughs> it has ways of, of stopping you from uh, from uh, doing it. Now, Lenny Susskind and his collaborators a number of years ago had uh, had a really interesting sort of proposal for another place in eternal inflation where you could have precise observables which takes advantage of the fact that in this uh, first picture of eternal inflation where you just keep popping from vacuum to vacuum, there are places where eventually you go into flat space. And in those regions, you might imagine being an observer there, in one of these uh, flat space regions. Then you could live for a long, long time, look what you see in the sky, and, uh, and, and that observer will actually see bubbles of all the other vacua, or enormous numbers of the other vacua, colliding with the bubble in which they live, and in principle, light from them can make it. So for those observers that they call the census taker, those observers that live inside these flat space regions, they can see the multiverse. It's not true that it's all philosophy, right? If they exist, uh, they can see the multiverse. Um, and so what they tried to do is come up with some notion of boundary observable, something like the S matrix, something like uh, boundary correlators that might make sense for those census takers. Um, but even that got, uh, confusing. It was not obvious that those census takers were completely immune from uh, fluctuations. Uh, so it's not obvious even theoretically whether precise observables exist, even for them. And more importantly, conceptually, it's not at all clear why we should care about those observables. Because those are the observables for these guys that are exponentially different than us. Unlike these other cases, like the S-matrix, uh, where the precise observable is continuously connected to something that we do care about. So, there are ways of trying to connect eternal inflation to more ordinary physics, 
And every way you do it, it there are some, there's some interesting, uh, uh, there's, there's some interesting um, difficulty. To, uh, yeah. Thank you.